This is the day that the Lord has made. I heard some calling that out. Thank you. Very welcome to those of you who are watching us online this morning. We're glad that you're with us as well. And we ex extend a special welcome to those who might be visiting with us today. If you're visiting with us today, we have a gift we'd like to give you um, located at the back of the church. And uh, we hope that uh, somebody will, will, will uh, suss you out and see that you get that. So it's good to be in the Lord's house this morning. Once again, the second week in a row, thanks be to God. Uh, I do want to remind you, just look at the and the announcements that are printed in the bulletin and to become aware of things that are happening in the church and uh, not only so that you can be part of it but also that you can keep those things in your prayer. As we come to the Lord, let us uh, prepare our hearts and our minds to worship Him as we listen to our, our prelude, Bring Us Back to Thee, O Lord. Morning. morning. Even though it's not noted in the uh, bulletin, I'm going to ask that we all stand for the opening hymn, if you are able. Holy, holy, holy.
you bow with me in prayer. O gracious and holy God, we ask today that you'd give us diligence to seek you, that you give us wisdom to perceive you, that you give us patience to wait for you. And we ask, O God, that you'd also give us a mind to focus upon you, uh, eyes that we can behold you, ears that we can listen to your word, and hearts that love you and the life dedicated to proclaiming your goodness through the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you. And also Let's turn and exchange signs, waves, whatever, to one another. Peace. <clears throat> Just want to take a moment uh, for our uh, stewardship to say thank you for your faithfulness in, in giving. The offering plates are in the entrances where you came into this worship space this morning. And uh, the gifts that we give to God, he uses. It's a wonderful thing to be um, the Lord's agent in the world. And that's what we are in so many different ways. Um, our giving just being one of the many ways God would want to use us for his kingdom in this world. So thanks for being part of the partnership that we share together as the body of Christ here at First Church to proclaim Christ's goodness, not only in the words that we, that we share, but in the deeds that we do in our neighborhoods and around the world. Uh, you can send your gifts uh, if you're, uh, to uh, First United Methodist Church, 225 South 2nd Street, here in Chambersburg, Pennsylvania, or you can go online uh, to firstonsecond.org and click on the word give. And uh, we have wonderful people that make sure that those gifts are used to the very best of their ability for the work of Christ. Let's come before God in a moment of prayer. Heavenly Father, we're thankful today to be able to be in this place once more to worship you, to fellowship with one another, 
to sing your praise, to listen to your word, to meditate on it uh, together. We pray, Lord, that uh, as we bow before you and we lift up the concerns of our heart, uh, that you would hear us and that as we humbly bring you in this moment of, of silence our petition, uh, that your will would be done. Lord, as we move through this season of Lent, we're reminded uh, repeatedly of our need to submit to you, of our need to commit ourselves to following you afresh. And we ask, Lord, um, today in this Sunday in the season of Lent, that uh, as, we, as we celebrate the goodness that we've experienced in our relationship with you, that you would also inspire us to share that goodness with others. You've given each of us a mission, Lord, uh, to fulfill. You've given each of us a calling. You've placed in each of us gifts that are to be used in your service, gifts that make a difference in the world and in people's lives. And Lord, sometimes we just have a hard time believing that you could use us. But I pray for each one of us today as we bow before you that you would help us to see that it's not about our ability, it is about your ability working in us that enables us to make uh, this difference. We pray, Lord, in our, in our life, uh, in the life of our church, uh, that uh, there will be a, a, a growing uh, closeness to you that manifests itself in greater and greater willingness to to present what we have for your use from, our, from out of our lives. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity we have uh, to, to share out of abundance with others. We pray, Father, for those today also that physically we can't do anything for but pray. And we know, Lord, that prayer is the greatest thing that we can do. And so we pray, Lord, for those who are who are suffering loss. We ask, Lord, for your comforting spirit to be with them. We pray, Father, for those who are ill in the hospital, for those with COVID, for those with other kinds of illnesses. We pray, Father, for your sustaining grace. We pray, Father, for our nation and the world as they move through this pandemic, that you will help the distribution of uh, vaccines so that people can be protected. And Lord, we are thankful. We are grateful for um, vaccines that now are being distributed. We are so uh, happy to know that there's a change is happening and that we're moving through towards a conclusion. Lord, give us patience and give us wisdom as we continue uh, to wait. Uh, we pray, Father, for the places in the world where there is lingering conflict, where there is lingering need, and we ask, Lord, for your intervention in those places through the body of Christ in many places. And we thank you, Lord, especially for your presence with us here this morning as we worship you, as we have gathered in your name, and as we submit our lives in this hour of worship. And all of this we ask through the name of the Lord Jesus who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture lesson today is from the Gospel of Luke, 10th chapter verses 1 through 24, Jesus sends out the 72. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. And he told them, the harvest is plentiful, 
but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go, I'm sending you out like lambs among wolves. Do not take a purse or a bag or sandals and do not greet anyone on the road. And when you enter a house, say, peace to this house. And if a man of peace is there, your peace will rest on him. And if it not, it will return to you. Stay in that house, eating and drinking whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. And when, or, when you enter a town and are welcomed and eat what is set before you, heal the sick, those that are there, and tell them that the kingdom of God is near you. But when you enter a town and are not welcomed, go into its streets and say, even the dust of your town that sticks to our feet we wipe off against you. Yet be sure of this, the kingdom of God is near. And I tell you, it will be more tolerable on that day for Sodom than for that town. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles that were performed in you have been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be lifted up to the skies? No, you will go down to the depths. He who listens to you, listens to me. He who rejects you, rejects me. But he who rejects me, rejects him who sent me. The 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. And Jesus replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from the heaven. I've given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. At that time, Jesus, full of joy through the Holy Spirit, said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you've hidden these things from the wise and the learned, and you've revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this was your good pleasure. All things have been committed to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father, and no one knows who the Father is except the Son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. And then he turned to his disciples and he said privately, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see, for I tell you that many prophets and kings wanted to see what you see, but they did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but they did not hear it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
that shall unclasp and set me free. Silently now I wait for thee, ready, my God, thy will to see. Open my eyes, Thou sendest clear, and while the wave notes fall on my ear, everything false will disappear. Silently now I wait for thee, ready, my God, thy will to see. Open my ears, illumine me, Spirit divine. Open my mouth and let me bear gladly the warm truth everywhere. Open my heart. children thus to share. Silently now I wait for thee, ready, my God, thy will to see. Open my Bruce Larson, a well-known preacher, once told the story about a man who was praying like this. Lord, I ask you to make me successful, but Lord, I also ask that you would keep me humble. And his wife, who was there with him while he was praying and heard, responded to his prayer with a prayer of her own. Yes, Lord, make my husband successful, but I will keep him humble. <laughs> so while the man was asking for only two things, only one of those things was essential. He was asking for success. The other would be provided uh, by his wife. In the gospel story that uh, Diane read for us this morning is about what Jesus says was essential for these 70 disciples to have with them as they prepared for this journey on which Jesus was sending them. Packing for a trip is not my favorite thing to do. I do not like packing at all. And my wife will tell you I'm a procrastinator because of that, and so I'm the last one packing. And there's a reason for that. You know, I, depending on how long we're going, I, I feel like I never know how many pairs of pants to pack or what the weather's going to be or how many shirts do I need and socks and so forth. And now I keep thinking, well, should I take my laptop or would my smartphone be enough? Uh, and how many chargers for all the stuff that I take will I need to, to carry with me and should I take a sweater or a jacket or a coat? I mean, these are the things that go through my head when I, when I pack. And though it might, as I've just said, that it might, seem, might not seem like it, I do believe that the best way to travel is to travel light. <laughs> and similarly, the point that Jesus is making in the passage today is that as these disciples are going out, he intends for them to travel light. Now, 
The context for this passage is, of course, um, that it follows right along behind what we talked about last week from Luke chapter 9. And in that passage, if you remember our, our, the, the, the message last week, um, uh, Jesus was giving th- those that were listening to him instructions also about what it meant to, uh, to follow him. Now, pr- earlier on in Luke's Gospel, chapter 9, there is a very similar e- conversation that Jesus has and teaching that he has for the 12 disciples. And he tells them similar things that he's saying here to these 72 or 70, and we'll talk about that in a moment. He gives them the same authorization, these 72 or 70, that he had given to the disciples over uh, evil uh, presence and also over illness so that they could heal and that they could set people at it free. So, in what's, what's going on in this particular telling of the tale, uh, of the instruction that we need to recognize? So let's look at a couple of details. And as I just mentioned about last week, in that passage, Jesus, we're told, had set his face toward Jerusalem. And as he's headed out to Jerusalem, there was, he was rejected by a Samaritan village because he was headed to Jerusalem, and he used that, uh, that rejection as a launching point to talk to his disciples about what they were to do when they also experienced rejection because of him. And along with that, he makes it clear that if you're going to be a disciple of his, then there were some things that you needed to know about the costs of that and how to, how to follow. And the gospel says in our reading this morning that after this, after that whole conversation that we, that we looked at last week from Luke 9, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place that he was about to go. So he's expanding this number. He, it's this, it goes from 12 that he sent, and now he's sending out 70. He's expanding his influence as he moves towards Jerusalem, as he moves toward the conclusion of his earthly ministry, as he plans to go to the cross and to do the work for which God had sent him to do. Now, there's something interesting about that number, and it's interesting, depending upon whatever uh, ancient text, the translation that you use, it will say either 70 or 72. It's not a big deal, but there's an interesting thing about the number 70. Uh, the number 70 in, in Hebrew thought of Jesus' day was that, there, that 70 represented the totality of the people of earth. And they based that on Genesis chapter 10, where there is listed there the 70 grandsons of Noah, right around the time of the Tower of Babel, And those 70 grandsons of Noah represented the 70 nations that populated the earth, each grandson having a a nation of his own. So so remember the 12 disciples, we think the the number 12 is significant in the Bible, 12 disciples, 12 tribes of Israel, 70 going out now into all the villages and places he intended, representing the nations of the world. And the idea is that Jesus... uh, uh, Ministry, starting with 12 to the nation of Israel, 12 tribes. Now his his vision is going to 70 nations of the world. And it's this expanding idea that God's kingdom is moving out. God's kingdom is expanding and God's kingdom is growing. This is an interesting thought. But as he sends these 70 out, he sends them out two by two. In his uh, book, Outliers, Malcolm Goldwell tells a strange story about Christopher Langham. He was a genius with a staggering IQ of around 195. Einstein's was only 150. Um, during high school, Langham would, could ace any foreign language test by skimming the textbooks two or three minutes before the exam. He scored perfect scores 
on his SATs, even though at one point he fell asleep during the exam. Uh, but he failed to use all those gifts, those exceptional gifts. And uh, there's nothing wrong with this, but he ended up living his life working on a f- horse farm in uh, Missouri. According to Caldwell, Lang, Langen never had, he, this is why he said he, this things didn't, he didn't use his gifts, was because he never had a community. He never had a support system that would enable him to capitalize on his gifts. And he summarizes it with one sentence. He said, Langan had to make his way alone, and no one, not rock stars, not professional athletes, not software billionaires, not even geniuses, ever makes it alone. And if the church of Jesus Christ needs to know anything, it is this, that we never make it alone in the kingdom. We need others each other. And Jesus demonstrates that and codifies it by sending out his disciples two by two and now these 72 by two. We don't go as lone rangers into this world. We go with each other. We go supported. So as Jesus gets them ready to go, he inspires them with this image says, look, I'm sending you out. There's a, there's, a, there's a world out there. This is waiting for you. They're ripe for the harvesting, which is a, an idiom that was used in Jewish, Jewish tradition in that time too. The, the rabbis would say, it's, the world is ripe for us to teach the, the Torah, to teach the law. Jesus applies it now to the world is ripe to hear about the good news of what I am going to do in this world. And then just to keep the inspiration going, he says, and I'm sending you out like lambs out to wolves. And I think, whoa. (laughs) That's not very assuring. You know, you think about about having a wolf pack out in the wild and all of a sudden somebody sends out lambs. And you can imagine the carnage that would ensue. But Jesus says, you know, you're... It's just one more thing that he has to say, that he he needs to get in their mind, that he's going to develop as he continues to teach them. This is a dangerous thing. It is a dangerous thing. It is a not safe thing to follow Christ. When we follow Christ, uh, some people have said, Jesus comes and bids you die. You know, lay down your life for the Lord. And, And following Christ is not always rarely easy. It's dangerous. When I was a, um, when our kids were really little, uh, I read to them from the Chronicles of Narnia, and when the pandemic struck uh, early on, uh, one of the things that my daughters wanted me to do was to read the Chronicles of Narnia to them again. I did it over Marco Polo, this video thing, but every night I would read a chapter or two and record it, and then the girls could watch their dad uh, reading uh, the Chronicles of Narnia, which I highly recommend uh, to anybody, whether you have children or grandchildren or not. Read it for yourself, but read it for them. But in that story, there's this, there's this point in time where Lucy, who's a little girl from our world, gets into Narnia through a wardrobe and meets some people, and, and, it's, and she and her, and, and later she comes back with her siblings, and they're taken into the shelter of Mr. and Mrs. Beaver, and they're having a conversation around the table, and the conversation turns to Aslan, and Aslan is the main character of the story, and they begin to tell the children about Aslan, who is a lion, a huge lion, who, who is the rightful ruler of Narnia, and Lucy gets a little concerned with this idea that they might meet this lion, and she, she asks Mr. and Mrs. Beaver, is he safe? And Mrs. Mr. Beaver says, safe? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. Aslan, by the way, is a Christ figure in the story. And similarly, Christ is not safe. He saves us, but when you commit your life to Christ, he tells us, you know, 
the adventure with me might be dangerous, and you should expect it. It isn't safe to follow Jesus, but it is good. Whatever Jesus calls us to do, it is ultimately good. Wherever he calls us to go, it is, all, it is going to be good. Whatever he calls us to be, it will be good. And so Jesus gives these instructions to, his, to these 70. He says, uh, first, don't take anything with you. No bag, no money, no change of clothes, nothing. I travel light. And at the end of this mission, you will know, he didn't say this, but this is the point, that God brought your success. He doesn't want them to be prepared physically. He wants them to be dependent totally on God and on those to whom God would send them. And as I thought about that, I thought, you know, preparation is a really good thing, but preparation is not the most important thing. Dependence on God is the most important thing in any endeavor we launch for Christ. I mean, it's good to prepare, you know, you got to think, but the most important thing is de- being dependent, totally reliant on God. We don't need to do, what we need to do is do more praying than we do preparing so that everything's dependent on God working in us. And then secondly, he says, don't greet anybody on the way, which kind of smacks against what we say about hospitality. <laughs> but the point is, not to be antisocial, not to be uh, uh, grumpy gusses. Jesus is making the point, don't greet anybody on the way because greeting on the way leads to sitting down and having a meal and being distracted from the important mission I'm sending you on. That's his point. Don't greet anybody, just like me, with my mindset towards Jerusalem, focus on where I'm sending you and get there and share the gospel because it's urgent. And one of the things that maybe we have lost is this sense of urgency that Jesus seems to be instilling into the lives of the disciples. This is an urgent message that you have to share. It's urgent time. Don't dilly-dally. Don't get distracted. Go and do it. So we ask ourselves, what is distracting me? What's keeping me from the sense of being urgent in the need to share this good news? And thirdly, Jesus says, when you make a connection with somebody there in those villages, you eat the food that they give you, sleep in the bed that they provide for you, don't go wandering around and going from place to place. Be grateful for what you've got because a, a, a worker is worthy of his wages and stay there and know that this is a place I've sent and prepared for you. This is a, what some would call a divine appointment. And in our lives, we need to look at the relationships that God enables us to have as divine appointments. That these are people in whose lives Jesus would have us invest our time in sharing the gospel. And hopefully we have people in our lives who are needing the Lord, who are hurting and and are needing what we have discovered in Christ. And if there are, then we need to commit to those people to be for them the hands and the feet, the mouthpiece, the heart of Jesus. And to commit to stay there and to give to them the blessing of God's peace that they need so much. And then fourthly, Jesus spends some time to say, okay, look, it's not always going to work out. And if they do to you what they did to me, then just shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. Jesus goes into a little bit of a a long statement here about judgment. He talks about, you know, Chorazin and Bethsaida and Capernaum, and it's not good. But he's saying to them, if if Tyre and Sidon and Tyre and uh, Sidon were places that the Jewish people knew at the time, they were kind of, they were pagan centers of of life, Jesus said it will be better for them than for these Jewish towns who rejected me and what I offered on the day of judgment. So the point that Jesus is trying to say to them is, look, move on, don't get stuck. God will take care of them. You have people who are waiting 
for this message. They are ripe for the harvest. You take this message to them where it will be received. And so they went out, and we don't know how long they were out. We don't know what the time lapse was between verse 16 and verse 17, but in verse 17, when they came back, it says they came back, they returned with joy. They returned with what created this joy? Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. They came back rejoicing because they had experienced amazing things because of using Jesus' name to bless people, to heal people, to set people free. Do you know what it feels? You know what it feels like if you've been involved in ministry at First Church. There is joy from doing the Lord's work. There is joy involved for the, the giver as well as the receiver. It's a joy to share the good news and have someone receive it and, and commit their life to Christ. It's a joy not only for them, it is a joy for you who've shared the message. It is a joy not only to those who received assistance and help, it's a joy to those of us who have been able to do it in Jesus' name. And it's in Jesus' name that all the difference is made. It says, they obeyed in your name, in, in, in your name, Lord. Everything we do is to be in Jesus' name. If we're to experience this joy, Jesus says, I saw Satan fall from heaven. Some people say, well, that's a reference to the early, you know, back the, the dawn of time when Satan and his angels fell out of heaven because of rebellion to God. Or some people say, well, though that's looking at to the end in Revelation and how Satan falls. No. This is a very specific reference to what Jesus happens when they come back with this report that, that these 70 people had extended the kingdom of God, had made inroads for the gospel into a place that normally had been held captive by demonic influence. Jesus recognizes that God's kingdom is pushing Satan back. And Satan falls back from these, the work of these 70 people. And God's kingdom advances where it rightfully belongs. Anytime we share the message of Christ and somebody receives it, the kingdom of God expands and moves outward. Anytime we do something in Jesus' name, in Jesus name and people recognize that it is God and give, him, give God thanks, the kingdom of God expands. And that's what we're called to do. And Jesus' response is he was full of joy himself. Over what was it? Jesus rejoices. Whenever we trust him, whenever we take steps of faith to follow him, whenever we go out, not depending upon how we've prepared ourselves or whatever books we've read or anything else, but depending completely upon him to do what he can do through us, it brings Jesus joy to see us being used by him in his name, and expanding God's kingdom in this world. That's our mission. That's our journey. And that's how we're called to prepare. We're called to prepare for that journey by throwing ourselves completely on the grace, mercy, and, in, and, and working power of God. So in your life today, as you're following the Lord and in your own spirituality in your own ministry um, know, know this that God gives you everything you need Jesus says in the passage of scripture that we read tw verse 22 you might want to underline that verse all things have been committed to me by my father if, every, if Jesus has had, has had everything committed to himself and if Jesus has committed all that to us we don't need anything else. It's all found in him. He's prepared on our behalf. Let's step out on this journey. Prepared with Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you today for the mission you've called us to here at First United Methodist Church. Lord, help us to follow you to go where you call us, knowing that, that you have everything we need. And as we call upon you, you will supply it as we go forward. 
And Lord, help us to know that joy that you share with us when your kingdom's work is done in our midst. In your precious name we pray. Amen. So church, let's stand up and boldly declare what we need, what we know to be true about this faith that Jesus calls us to. Would you please stand with me? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sit at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. to
if we commit to make this prayer that we just sang our prayer, the Lord will do something in our life, I'm, I'm convinced. The Lord has something for you this week to do in his name. A life he wants to bless through you. And he's given you everything you need to do it. So go in Jesus' name into this week. Trusting in God's abiding presence with you. And the power of the Holy Spirit in your life through faith in Christ. That you might expand the kingdom of God where you are. Amen. Thank you.